This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello and welcome to WLC Radio, uh, where our mission is to spread the wonderful news of the Saviour's soon return, as revealed by Bible prophecy. I'm Miles Roby, and joining me is Dave Wright. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. Now, I'm really excited about the programme that we've got planned for today. It's yeah. all about faith. Mm. And we're going to be sharing some simple, practical steps that you can do to nurture faith in your life. OK, if you've joined us before, you'll know that WLC, we prefer whenever possible to use the personal name of the creator. Uh, scripture urges us to call upon the name of the Lord. But how can you do that if you don't know what his name is? And it doesn't actually say to call upon the name of the Lord. The original Hebrew inserts his name, which is mm. Yahweh or Yah. So what the Bible is telling us to do is to call upon the name of Yahweh. And there's a good reason for that. The name of Yah comes from the Hebrew verb of being, Haya. Uh, we're not used to using a verb of being as a name, but that's the Father's name. And it fits. Any verb of being, yeah. am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been, all of those perfectly reflect the fact that his existence is the originating source of everything else and that he is the only self-existent being that is, that was, or that shall ever be. Mm. And that in itself is a promise that he will never leave you or forsake you. He will always be right there for you. Hebrew names were always very rich in meaning, weren't they? Mm. You know, the Saviour's name isn't Jesus, but is actually Yahushua, which also describes what he is. He's Yahuwah's salvation. You might also hear us use the words El or Elohim. These are Hebrew titles used throughout the Old Testament that refer to the Father. In fact, in your modern translation, most times you see the word God. The actual word in Hebrew is Elohim. All right, faith, 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 faith. Well, I've been looking forward to today's programme because faith is so crucial to the Christian walk, it really is. And without faith, of course, doubts not only creep in, but they take over. And soon there's nothing left of that vital connection between the soul and our maker. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So today Dave is going to share some practical simple steps on how we can increase our faith. So let's start by defining precisely what faith is. Now, while you look that up, Miles, I've got a story that illustrates why faith is so important. I read this story years ago when I was reading the biography of the life of an English lord. Now, I don't remember who it was, just that he lived in the late 18th to early 19th centuries, somewhere around there. Now, on his estate, there was this rock wall that he wanted demolished. I think he was planning on using gunpowder or something. Anyway, his little boy wanted to be there to watch it demolished, and the nobleman, whoever he was, had promised his son that he'd make sure the boy was there to see it. So what happened then? Well, as it happened, his workers didn't get the memo to wait and went ahead and demolished the wall even though the boy wasn't there. I don't know whether he was away at school or what, but he wasn't there. So, so what did the father do then? Well, what would you do? Uh, well, I'd probably apologise to my son, for, for first off, and tell him the men hadn't known they were there to wait, and so they'd gone ahead and taken it down. Yeah, and I think that's probably what I'd do as well, but that's not what this father did. He'd given his word to his son that the boy could watch, and he wanted his son to know he could trust his father's word. He had the workman rebuild the wall wow. just so that he could keep his promise to the boy. <laughs> you got to be kidding. He actually paid his workmen to rebuild the wall 
just so they could tear it down again? Well, no. He went to the extra expense of having the wall rebuilt so that he could honour his promise to his son. This man knew that a promise is only as good as the faith the other person has Mm. in the promise giver's word. Yeah, good point, good point. So time was when a man's word was his bond. Business deals were sealed with a handshake back then. No paperwork or monetary deposits were necessary, were they? No, the nobleman was a very wise father. He Mm. knew that for his son to be able to trust his father's word, the boy had to have faith that his daddy would always keep his promises. Okay, could you go ahead now and read the definition of faith? What does it say? Well, it says here, it says faith is, quote, belief, the assent or agreement of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another, resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence, unquote. Faith is nothing more, nothing less than the absolute confidence that what someone is telling you is the truth without needing any other evidence to back it up. See, put like that, I can see why a father would bend over backwards to keep his word to his son. And I can see Yahuwah doing that too as well. You know, he knows our faith in his promises is vital to overcoming. So practically speaking, what are some more specific steps we can take to increase our faith in Yah? Well, the first thing to do is to realize that faith itself is a gift. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 tells us Yah has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now you see this is key to increasing your faith because while faith is necessary to claim the promises of Yah, faith itself is a gift. I've read Romans 12 verse 3 before but it's it's never really sunk in that it's a gift too. I mean, I guess I've had this idea that faith is like a, a rare spiritual accomplishment. You know, some people have attained while others haven't. Well, yeah, and you're not the only one to think that either. Bruce McConkie wrote, quote, Faith is a gift of God bestowed as a reward for personal righteousness. It is always given when righteousness is present, and the greater the measure of obedience to God's laws, the greater will be the endowment of faith. Mm. See, the, the word sound righteous. Yeah, well, I, is- I know, but... Yeah. yeah, it's a mixture of truth and error. That's the mm. problem. Yeah, the truth is that faith is a gift, but the error is that it's a gift given only to the righteous as a reward for personal righteousness. Yeah, it contradicts Romans twelve verse three uh, that says Yah has given everyone the gift of faith, and personal righteousness is not a prerequisite. Mm. Think about it. Let's say a, a person has made some poor choices and landed himself in jail. Yeah. The fear, the stress, it's all overwhelming. And in his hour of need, he turns to Yah. Now, you can't say he's righteous. Oh, no. So in his hour of need, feeling the depths into which he has sunk, if he turns to Yah and prays, Lord, I do believe, help thou mine unbelief. Is Yahweh going to refuse to gift him with more faith just because he lacks personal righteousness? Well, of course not. I mean, no. In fact, this, this whole idea that faith is a reward for personal righteousness also contradicts Romans 3, uh, verses 10 to 12, actually. So listen to this. It says, quote, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after Yah. They have all turned aside. Mm, perfect, yeah. Mm. So this idea that faith is some special spiritual attainment is wrong. Yeah. Yes, faith is necessary to overcoming. It's, it's vital, but it's also a gift of divine grace. Now, earlier on, you quoted Hebrews 11, verse 6, but only the first part of the verse. Why don't yep. you just turn there now and read the entire thing for us? Because this will really shed some light on this issue. Okay, well, I've got it here, and it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to Yah must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you want to increase your faith, the first thing to do is to go to Yah and ask him for more. You can't please him without it, but it's not something you can conjure up in yourself. It Mm. is a gift, but it's one that you can ask for. Yeah, I think, too, it's important to realise that because it's a gift, we've got to accept it if we want it. 
the Yar never forces anyone to accept his gifts. You know, we, we've got the power, the Yar given right to reject his gifts. So if you want more faith, I think it's important to make a conscious choice not to only ask for more faith, but to accept it. Yes, and remember too that faith is not a feeling. I think this is where a lot of people get confused. Mm. They assume that if they have faith, they've got this sort of nice, warm, fuzzy feeling, yeah. but but yeah. that's not faith at all. Yeah. Remember the definition you read? Uh, faith is the assent or agreement of the mind that what someone else is saying is indeed the truth without needing any other evidence. That's one step further than belief. And that sort of confidence comes only when you know the other person enough to trust him. Mm -hmm. So that's the next step in increasing your faith. Get to know Yahweh for yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When it comes to salvation, it's not what you know, but who you know. And we don't talk about this much, to be honest, but Ezekiel 14 verse 20 spells it out. It says, quote, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith Yahuwah Eloah, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. The only way we can do that is investing time in a personal relationship with our Maker. Mm -hmm. It's not what church you go to. It's not what your pastor says. In fact, that can make it harder to accept new truth. Ultimately, it comes down to, do you know Yahuwah for yourself? So what's the best way to do that then, Dave? Well, simply put, spend time with him. Mm. Not just a hurried prayer in the morning as you rush out the door. Read and meditate on his word. If you maybe drive to work, listen to uplifting music. If you take the train, spend that time memorising scripture. Let your thoughts turn to him throughout the day. Get to know him as a person. I like that. Get to know Yah as a person. See, Psalm 34 verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. That's, a, that's an invitation to do more than just sit in a pew once or twice a week and listen to someone else talk about him, isn't it? The only way anyone can accept the word of Yah at face value, not needing any other evidence, is if he or she has gotten to know him on a very personal, deeply intimate level. If you want to increase your faith, make it a habit to start exercising faith on a daily basis. Search for a promise that fits your need and claim it. Pray very specifically. It has been said that faith is a plant that will grow quickly when nurtured. So, start nurturing it. The way you do that is by choosing to make it a daily habit to exercise faith. So I remember Elisa O'Brien talking about a friend of hers whose family went through a very difficult time. The friend got these large pieces of paper and wrote promises on them, then posted them all over her house. You know, doors, stair landings, the refrigerator, any flat surface where her eyes would rest while walking through the house. She said it felt like being surrounded by Yah's personal presence, like a giant hug. Yes, I remember that one, actually. Mm. And she said at first it was difficult to trust 100% in the promises because it was a scary, dangerous situation for her family. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So e even though she didn't emotionally feel it, she made a conscious choice to trust those promises, regardless of her feelings. And Yah brought the family through unscathed. You see, the net effect was that this woman and her family had a deeper, more personal knowledge of Yahuwah for themselves than they'd ever had before. Yeah, and I believe it as well. There's mm. nothing that builds faith quite like tasting and seeing that Yah is good for yourself. Amen, absolutely. Uh, we'll be right back with more practical steps on how to increase faith. Sunday keepers claim Galatians teaches the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. Saturday keepers use the same text to claim Yahweh's feasts are no longer binding. And everyone claims that the weak and beggarly elements mentioned in Galatians 4 refers to the Israelite law they say is no longer binding on Christians today. However, once you have an understanding of the issues involved, you quickly realise that Paul is saying something entirely different. If it were possible for Yah's law to be changed or set aside, Yahushua would not have needed to die. 
Yah could have just changed the wages of sin to being some punishment other than death. If you want to understand Paul's letter to the Galatians, you need to listen to the WLC radio episode, Paul and Galatians. Just what was he talking about? Go to worldslastchance.com, click on the WLC radio icon and scroll down to listen. Again, that's Paul and Galatians, just what was he talking about, on worldslastchance.com. You can also look for it on YouTube. You were just saying that there's nothing quite like tasting and seeing that Hya is good for yourself to build faith. Now, what does that look like on a day-to-day basis then? So, you know, practically speaking, how do we taste and see that Yar is good? I think one of the best ways is simply to make it a daily habit to claim the promises. If faith is a plant that will grow quickly when nurtured, start nurturing it. Look for promises that fit your current situation and make a point to claim those promises. Now, Smith Wigglesworth was a British evangelist born in 1859. Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> Sorry, his mummy hate him or something. <laughs> I, I don't think so, no. <laughs> Regardless of his name, he was quite influential in the early history of Pentecostalism. Now, I don't agree with everything he believed, but he said something once that I thought was actually quite insightful. He said, fear looks, faith jumps. I'll just say that again. Fear looks, mm-hmm. faith jumps. Okay. Now, when you were little, did your mum or dad ever tell you, Jump and I'll catch you. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. What did you do? I jumped. And what did they do? <laughs> they caught me, of course, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you see, there's no of course about it. I read the story once of a little boy whose daddy told him, jump and I'll catch you. The lad jumped and the father let the little boy fall to the floor. Oh, that's horrible. What a way to destroy trust. Yeah, well, the little boy was obviously hurt, both physically mm. and emotionally. And as he cried, his father told him, remember this and never trust anyone. Now, apparently, the little boy was P.T. Barnum, an American showman of the mid-19th century, and a phrase widely attributed to him is the statement, there's a sucker born every minute. Wow, what a terrible thing to do to a trusting child. Exactly. Now, contrast that with your experience as a child. Mm. The first time your parents said, jump and I'll catch you, did you immediately jump? Well, if I'm being strictly honest, no. Oh, obviously, I was worried that they dropped drop me or miss, but I eventually jumped and they did, in fact, catch me, yeah. So the next time they said, jump and I'll catch you, was there as much hesitation? No, and I jumped straight off. I mean, in fact, I remember one time my father almost did drop me because he wasn't expecting me to jump, <laughs> you know, but he still caught me, which is good. Uh, I jumped because by that point I had every confidence, obviously, that he'd, he'd catch me. Uh, he proven that he could and he would so i had no worries whatsoever so your personal experience taught you that you could trust mum and dad to do what they said oh yeah yeah and that's how it is with yahuwah when we find ourselves in trouble and we don't know what to do we need wisdom help deliverance money healing a job whatever and then we claim a promise and choose to trust yah's word our faith will grow exponentially And you see, it's not going to grow if we never exercise it. Mm. I like the use of the word exercise in this context as well. Yes, you know, faith is a gift, but it works rather like a a muscle, doesn't it? You know, a flexing muscle. A muscle grows stronger when it's slightly damaged. Then when the muscle is allowed to rest, it grows stronger in the repair process. And that's what faith does as well. You know, when you think about it, it grows stronger when it's stressed or under pressure. Speaking for myself, of course, I know sometimes I'm so desperate to get out of a stressful situation that resolving the problem consumes my focus when, in reality, Yah may very well be allowing it, just so that I can exercise my faith and grow it stronger. Yeah, well put. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think we all tend to get impatient when we're stressed or hurting. We point to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24, and pray, See, Father, right there you say, Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Okay, I'm calling now, so where's my answer already? (laughs) It sounds about right. You know, know, I've I've prayed that sort of prayer before, I really have. It becomes by default our favourite promise to claim. But (laughs) what we need to be doing is learning patience and that it's safe in all circumstances to wait upon Yahuwah. Turn to Psalm 27. This passage really addresses this issue. 
It opens with the well-known declaration, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But I'd like you now to read how this psalm ends. Could you read verses 13 and 14 of Psalm 27, please? Sure. It says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of Yahuwah in the land of the living. Wait on Yahuwah. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Yahuwah. Trials have a purpose, and if we will remember that, then instead of immediately demanding deliverance, we will trust in Yah even when we don't see how deliverance will come. In fact, troubles are specifically designed to teach us lessons in faith, and the sooner we learn to submit, the easier it will be. Instead of looking at the difficulties, we need to be grateful for the opportunity we have to see Yah work on our behalf. We need to trust him and thank him for the chance to have our faith increased. You see, this really is speaking to my own heart. I can see where I need to learn patience and trust. It reminds me of Peter's words in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Just to give me a quick second to find it. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, that's really beautiful, that is. Isn't Thank it you just? for sharing that. Yes, it's lovely. It brings me to the next point, actually, on how to increase your faith, and that is be grateful. When in the midst of stress, trial, fear, and doubt, you can express your gratitude, your faith will be strengthened. Could you read First Thessalonians chapter 5 for us, please, Mars? It's verses 16 to 18, because I think actually that this passage says it best. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of Yah in Christ Yahushua for you. It's impossible to doubt when you're actively praising Yah. It's impossible to give in to fear when you're focused on the many ways he's blessed you and delivered you in the past. Mm, that's true. When you're thinking of Yah for his blessings, your focus is not on the mountain in front of you, but on the handholds that will get you over the mountain. Mm, yeah. I know in my own experience that when I'm focused on praising Yah, uh, even in the midst of difficulties, I start to see possibilities, openings, you know, opportunities I didn't see when I was actually focusing only on the problem. Well, at first, it can be hard to change your focus, but you see, it does get easier. Start with a mental list of all the things you're thankful for. It's a great way to go to sleep at night, reviewing the day and all the ways you see Yah provided for you and your family in that day. And you see, the more that you do this, the more faith will grow in your heart. When you're aware of Yah's presence and when you take the time to notice the blessings he is constantly pouring out, your heart will respond with love and love awakens love mm. and that love will then increase your confidence in his word which in turn builds more faith you see it's a lovely beautiful process it really is it really is well one thing that has really helped me in gaining stronger faith is actually really simple to be honest uh, any of us under any circumstances can do it and that is to simply immerse myself in the word of yah let me just quickly read this from Romans 10, verse uh, 17. It says, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Yah. So when you immerse your mind in the promises of Yah, your faith will increase. You can't get more clear than that, can you? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> immerse yourself in the word of Yah, and your faith will grow. And the reason for that is wonderful, and that is that the word of Yah contains supernatural power to accomplish what the word says. 
I know we've touched on this theme before, but maybe for a listener who hasn't perhaps heard this concept before, let's just talk about it. Turn, mm. could you, to Isaiah chapter 55? I'm already there, matey. Oh, I'm already right. there. It's, <laughs> you see, it's a great passage as well. I'm well ahead of you. Uh, really faith-inspiring as well. If you missed our earlier programs on how to access divine power, it's not too late to listen to them right now. We upload all the audio files to YouTube as well as on our website. Uh, worldslastchance.com is our website. And just click on W. LC radio icon there, then just scroll down and there's two programs in particular that address this one. Now, one is entitled The Most Powerful Promise in the Universe and the other is Learn How to Access Divine Power. Mm. They, they're really both very, very good. Okay, uh, Isaiah 55. Yes, uh, start reading if you would at verse 6. 6, okay. It says, Seek Yahuwah while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yahuwah, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, right there, mm. that's a promise. We worship a God of love, a God yeah. who forgives. Yahuwah is saying that if we will return to him, he will have mercy on us. That's a promise. Mm. One you can trust, though the heavens fall. Okay, go on. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now listen, he's going to use a simile. He's going to liken his word to rain and the effect that it has on dry ground. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It, a Yah's word, that is, shall not return to me void, but it, Yah's word, shall accomplish what I please, and it, Yah's word, shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. He can't get more clear than that. His word itself contains the power that called the universe into existence. Yah's word contains divine, omnipotent power to do what that very word says. Psalm 33 verse 9, For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Precisely, and that's why Yah doesn't have to do anything to accomplish his will. He only needs to speak, and that power is contained in his word. So then when we immerse ourselves in that word, when we meditate on it, and I'm not talking, you know, about sitting in some lotus position chanting, Om. <laughs> I'm talking about letting our mind turn to him throughout the day. I'm talking about thinking about what we've read that morning and how it applies to our lives. And then our faith will begin to grow. Another thing I think that factors in here is self-talk. How do we talk to ourselves in our own mind in a way that is part of meditation? How so? Well, it's part of our thinking process. You know, words have power. They can react on our own thoughts and emotions. When we meditate on Yah's word, it's a form of speaking to ourselves and that releases the power of faith within us to believe whatever it is we're focusing on. Yeah, I can see that. The problem is, though, our words aren't always good. Well, you're right. <laughs> and negative words and thoughts can have an equally negative reaction upon us. But if we fill our minds with Yah's word, you know, immerse ourselves, as you said, then when we meditate on a promise, that becomes our self-talk. So, for example, um, take Romans 8, verse 28, which says, All things work together for good to those who love Yah, to those who are the called according to his purpose. When we meditate on that, that becomes our self-talk. You know, it begins to have an effect on our minds and our beliefs. Okay, yes, I see what you're saying. Uh, and because Yah's word has the power to do what it says, when you speak mm. those words to yourself, the yeah. words themselves give you the power to actually believe it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, likewise, First uh, Peter um, chapter 5, verse 7, which says, quote, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The words themselves contain the power to do what they say. So when you meditate on them, 
when you repeat them to yourself, the words themselves will create faith in you to believe Yah's word. Yeah, that's really nicely put, actually. Yes, yeah, I get that. And the more we study and spend time in the word of Yah, the more we meditate on what his words mean to us and repeat those same words back to ourselves, the more our faith is going to grow and the more we will believe his word. Look, we know we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of Yah, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All right, if salvation with all it entails is a gift, and it is, That means that faith itself is also a gift, and we need it in order to be saved. So it stands to reason that faith itself would also be a gift of Yah's abundant grace. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Would you like to learn more about Last Day events? World's Last Chance has over 50 articles on prophecy alone. If you want to know who the Antichrist is, if you wish to know what the mark of the beast really is, If you would like to learn about the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, visit our website at worldslastchance.com or look for WLC videos on YouTube. Prophecy is heaven's gift to the last generation, so you won't be taken by surprise. Get studying today at worldslastchance.com or watch WLC videos on YouTube. So, from where is today's Daily Mailbag question coming? France, the city of Bayonne, to be precise. Oh. Now, did you know that the French army was the first to use camouflage? They did it in 1915. Really? I didn't know that. Well, here's a bit of trivia to add to your personal collection. Uh, Did you know that in France you can marry a dead person? I beg your pardon. (laughs) Seriously, as long as you can prove the dead person intended to marry you, you can still get married even after the person dies. (laughs) Oh, and you do need special permission from the president to do so as well. Now, most recent case I know of that was a French policeman gunned down before he could get married. This was in 2017 as well, so his partner got permission to marry him posthumously. Well, hmm. Okay, sorry, just brains trying to work overload on this one. Um, I can see why that might be beneficial for inheritance or survivor's benefits or something, yes. Uh, I suppose it makes sense from that point of view when you think about it, but (laughs) it's a bit shocking when you first hear of it. I know, and that's why I mentioned it. You know, it's that very reaction, Dave, you know, shock, even sometimes disgust. Then understanding kind of goes along with our question. Ah, right. And it's a good one. Ella Manon Colbert writes, Dear Dave and Miles, I really enjoy your show and listen to every single chance I get. I always look forward especially to the advice part of your show, The Daily Mailbag. Now, I've noticed for a lot of the questions that you're asked, you don't give specific answers so much as to refer people to biblical principles. I really like that. My question today, though, is, is there one overarching principle in particular that, when in doubt, can be applied to any situation? Well, what a great question. Isn't thanks, it? Thanks very much indeed for writing in, Elena Manon, and uh, it's good to have you there. Yeah, really good question, and of course the answer is yes, there is. And Miles, in fact, could you turn to Matthew 22 uh-huh. and read for us verses 37 to 40? Here, Yahushua is explicitly spelling out a principle which, if understood correctly, can be applied to any situation in life and it will give you clarity and understanding. Okay, Miles, you've got it there. What does it say? Uh, Yahushua said to him, You shall love Yahuwah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The first principle, loving Yah with all your heart, soul and mind, covers you, your actions and behaviours. If you will make that the guiding principle in your life, making a full surrender to him, everything else in your life will fall into place. You'll be able to prioritise not only your words and actions, but decisions that affect every area of your life. And the second principle of loving your neighbour as yourself will give clarity in every interaction that you have with others. I think this is particularly important in the spiritual life, and that's actually what I was kind of thinking of after reading her question and and why I shared that tidbit uh, about being able to marry a dead person in France. It's so easy to see something in someone else's life and set ourselves up as judge and jury. Yeah. We look at them, and if they do something we think is wrong, it's tempting to judge them as not very good Christians. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And incidentally, I have a friend who lives in the United States, in California to be precise. Mm -hmm. Well, her father was dying of cancer, but he lived in the state of Maine. And going from her home in Los Angeles, California, to his home in Portland, Maine, that's over 3,000 miles away, or or almost 5,000 kilometres. Yeah, well, it's, that's further than going from London, England to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's a crazy amount of distance to go and still be in the same country. Uh, what happened? Well, after her dad took a turn for the worse, my friend was notified that if she wanted to see her father one last time, she needed to come immediately. So she booked a flight and got there a couple of hours before he passed. Now, the problem for my friend arose when she asked a friend of hers to keep an eye on her house and come in and feed her cat while she was gone. When her friend found out she was going to be flying out on the soonest flight to Maine, she told her that was wrong and a sin. Are you serious? Why is that? Well, because the flight was on the Sabbath. Oh. So her friend was of the opinion that she should book a later flight after the Sabbath and trust in Yar whether she got there in time to see her father one last time or not. Now, as it happens, if she had done that, she wouldn't have got there in time to see her dad before he died. Well, personally, I I don't like to travel on the Sabbath. Well, my point isn't what was right and who was wrong about travelling on the Sabbath. My point is that it was not the friend's place to judge, and it certainly wasn't her place to voice that criticism when my friend was already under a lot of stress and Mm. pain. Now, Elena Mano wanted to know what broad principle could apply to every situation. Well, loving your neighbour as yourself means that you do not set yourself up to judge them. Ever. That's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Yah doesn't call on anyone to judge another. And again, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict hearts, not ours. Reminds me of Yahushua's words in Matthew 7. I've almost got it. Just uh, quickly okay. uh, find it here. Listen while I read this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged and with the measure you use. It will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I love that passage. Mm. (laughs) It shows that Christ had a sense of humour, and it does sum up this issue perfectly. Now, I hate to say it, but the more conservative a Christian is, the more he or she tends to judge others. We're not called to do that. What we are called to do is to love Yah with all our heart, mind and soul, and our neighbour as ourselves. When those two commandments become our guiding principles we will have the clarity to know how to respond in any given situation. Mm, that's good. It's really good. All right. Um, just looking at my watch here, time for one more quick question, actually. Uh, Talib is writing from Shah Alam in Malaysia. He writes, I'm very interested in learning more about prophecy as it is being fulfilled. I know a lot of your programs and many of the articles on your website deal with prophecy. Do you have any place where you share updates on current events that fulfil prophecy. Thank you for all you do to spread truth. 
May Yahweh continue to bless you. That's nice. Thank you. Well, thank you, brother. Yes, and uh, indeed, we do have a place where we post breaking news on events that relate to prophecy being fulfilled. What I suggest you do on that one is go to our website, worldslastchance.com, which you obviously know about. Then in the search bar at the top of the page, type in there, Prophecy in the News. The news stories that we cover focus on developments in the United States and the Roman Catholic Church. These entities are the two dominant players presented in Revelation 13 as a beast from the sea and a beast from the earth. So it is important to keep a close eye on them both. We also cover any news related to Pope Francis as he is the eighth and last pope prophesied in Revelation 17. The end of his reign signifies the end of the world. And he's in his 80s, isn't he? Yes, and this is why the return of Yahushua can be measured in years, not decades. We cover any current events that point to the near fulfilment of the first woe of Revelation 9. The first woe won't be an alien attack, but a demon attack, presented to appear as if it were an invasion by aliens. Under this series of events, the Pope will emerge as humanity's saviour, and all the world leaders will surrender their authority to him, just as prophesied, in order to revive the collapsed world economy. And finally, any news that confirms humanity's cup of iniquity is overflowing, because that means divine judgment is about to be unleashed. So, yes, we cover a lot, and it's good to keep knowledgeable about current events, because this is what lets us know where we are in the stream of history, and that the end is very near. All right. Thank you, Dave. And uh, that's all we got time for today. We enjoy hearing from our listeners around the world. Keep sending us any comments or questions you may have. Just go to worldslastchance.com and click on contact us. You can even send us a prayer request as well. We pray over everyone we receive. Hello. This is Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Debbie Morrison was at the end of her rope. She was a single mother with a newborn son living in a new city far from any family that could help. She felt alone and very vulnerable. When you're poor and have no backup, it's very scary when something goes wrong, and Debbie was scared. The United States doesn't have a lot of public transportation, and her old car had quit working. How was she supposed to make the 30-mile, 48-kilometer trip to work without a car? How could she support her son if she lost her job? Desperate, she cried out to Yahweh, Father, my best isn't good enough. I can't do it anymore. I need you. I need you to show me that you can take care of my little boy and me. A few nights later, Ben, the husband of a friend, called Debbie and asked her if she would meet him down at the car dealership where he worked. Ben and his wife Laura were beautiful Christians whom Debbie really admired. She wasn't sure what the point was in going to the car dealership, but Ben told her Laura would babysit. All Debbie needed to do was trust Yah and go. At the car dealership, Ben showed her a car they had just received as a trade-in from an older couple. It was an almost new Buick with all the perks. It had an automatic transmission, power windows, heating and air conditioning, and a working radio. It even had cruise control, and it was very dependable. Debbie, of course, immediately loved the car, but knew it was well out of her price range. It's gorgeous, she told Ben, but there's no way I could ever afford anything like this. Well, how much do you have, he asked. Feeling foolish, she told him about the thousand dollars she had saved. It was all she had, not a penny more. What a coincidence, he grinned. A thousand dollars is exactly what this car costs. He handed her the keys and set her on a test drive while he finished up the paperwork. Debbie couldn't stop crying. Yah had heard her prayer. He had heard and answered it far beyond anything she had even dared to dream. She knew the car cost far more than a thousand dollars and that Ben and Laura were paying the balance themselves. Later, as she thought about the wonderful way Yah had provided for her desperate need, she realized that was exactly what Yahushua did for us on the cross. He paid far more than we ever could have for a gift we could never have afforded. 
In return, Yah just asks that we give Him all we have, ourselves. For those who make a full surrender to Yah, there is no problem too difficult for Yah to unravel, no hardship too complex for Him to resolve. Philippians 4 verse 19 says, For my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Yahushua. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. I know we're fast running out of time, but there's one passage I want to get to before we close, and that's James chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. So again, that's James chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. This gives us a really unique perspective on trials and the role of patience under trial. Okay, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of Yahuwah, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Hebrews 12 verse 1 tells us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. A large part of that endurance is being patient under trial and continuing to trust in Yah as much when things appear to be collapsing down around our ears as we do when things are going well. I like this passage that you just read from James because it tells us that there is a purpose to our trials and that purpose is to test our faith. And as we said, it's only when faith is tested that it gets stronger. Mm. It looks like James is describing a process, isn't it, really? Trials test our faith. A tested faith is a strong faith. Strong faith produces patience and trust. Patience and trust work in us, developing a character that is like the character of Yah. And notice that as we go through this process, what's the result? A stronger faith that lets you ask Yah for anything you need. And that's exactly what we need to get through the days ahead. Yes, salvation is a free gift. Faith itself is a gift. But unless it's tested, we don't know our own failings. Mm. There's nothing like trials to reveal what is in the heart. Isn't that the truth? The thing is, you don't increase your faith by simply stirring up strong emotions in yourself. You don't increase your faith by sheer grit, determination and the sweat of your brow. Instead, faith is a gift. It's the natural outcome of a loving, close friendship with Yah as your best friend. Mm. And that's such an important realisation to come to, isn't it? To know Yahuwah is to love him. Paul saw this connection between how well a believer knows and loves Yah and how much faith is at work in the believer's life. In fact, he spelled it out in this letter to Galatians. In uh, Galatians 5, verse 6, he said, quote, for in Yahushua Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith isn't something any of us can ever learn. It's not some reward for being righteous, since Romans 3 clearly states, There is none righteous, no, not one. It is always and ever shall be a gift. By cooperating with Yah, aligning your will with his, you can be gifted with the very faith of Yahushua himself and you will start gaining victories. I'm just going to insert a little promotion here for a recent program that gets into that even more because salvation is a gift. Justification is also a gift. A lot of people think that the law of Yah is no longer binding. It is, but even obedience is a gift. Now, once you've been gifted with Yahushua's own faith, obedience naturally follows. Like faith, obedience isn't something you can churn out. It has to flow from a heart that has been recreated or it's corrupted. 
You don't have to deny the perpetuity of the law of Yah because you know you can't keep it. He doesn't expect you to. He knows you can't. Right, absolutely. But with the gift of faith comes the gift of obedience. It's all Yah. When we surrender to him, he writes his law on our hearts. Listen while I read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 to 19. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of Yah, who has reconciled us to himself through Yahushua Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that Yahuwah was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Unquote. Mm. It says it there, right there, that all things, all things are of or from Yah. And that includes justification and the gift of faith, which brings with it the gift of obedience. It's all Yah. Amen. First John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of Yah overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You want more faith? Ask for it. Make it a daily habit to feast your mind on the word of Yah. Then, when your faith is tested, give thanks. Start making it a habit every day to get to know the Father on a personal level for yourself. Well, our time is up for today, but please join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. If you have committed to worshipping Yahweh on his holy Sabbath, calculated by his loony solar calendar established at creation, World's Last Chance has just the computer app for you. The World's Last Chance Loony Solar Calendar Guide was designed to meet the needs of lunar Sabbatarians worldwide. The algorithms used are extremely accurate and were obtained from Her Majesty's Royal Nautical Almanac Office in Great Britain. With our custom-created calendar guide, you can print off a Loony Solar Calendar with corresponding Gregorian dates or flip it around and print off a Gregorian calendar with corresponding Loony Solar dates. This is invaluable for calculating time off work. In addition, WLC's Loony Solar Calendar Guide provides a variety of astronomical information calculated for your specific area. You can learn the percentage of the moon illuminated, as well as sunrise and sunset times, and what time the moon rises and sets. Because the motions of the moon are so accurate, they can be predicted with great accuracy. This allows you to calculate future lunations so that work and school obligations can be scheduled around Yah's holy days. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com and start using it today. You can access it online, download it to your device or even integrate it into your own website. The WLC Looney Solar Calendar Guide, a great resource for everyone committed to honouring Yahweh on His holy days. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. 
The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open eager to receive all who come to Him. You have been listening to WLC Radio. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available for downloading on our website. These are great for sharing with friends and Bible studies. It is also a wonderful resource for those worshipping Yahuwah alone or at home. If you would like to listen to Radio WLC programmes, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. This will allow you to download the episodes in your preferred language. There are also articles and videos available in a variety of languages. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm -hmm.